1833, thousands of people were arrested, tortured and executed because their religious beliefs were not welcome in their homeland. They were victims of the Spanish Inquisition. The Inquisition has cast a long shadow, but it's been so obscured by myth that until now it's been hard to tell the real story of these dark days of the Catholic Church. The Spanish Inquisition is remembered as the first and possibly the most terrifying example of the thought police. It was established to rid Spain of heretics. The political and religious leaders of Spain believed that heresy would spread like a disease and prevent them from unifying the population under one flag, one royalty, and most importantly, under one religion. I think the need for the Inquisition in late medieval Spain was uh, a reflection of the fact that there were so many different races and peoples living in this same peninsula. Uh, there were Jews, there were Moors, and of course the Christians were always the most important, but at times they felt threatened by the power, the wealth, and the, the otherness of the other cultures that were living in Iberia at the time. The Inquisition itself was a roving religious court that sought out and punished crimes against God and the Catholic Church. In the process, cleansing Spain of its religious and cultural diversity. It recruited thousands of anonymous informants and shrouded its methods in a cloak of secrecy. Records from the time reveal the atmosphere of fear it generated. Everyone shudders at its very name, as it has supreme authority over property, life, honor, and even the souls of men. Modern academics are re-examining the available evidence and drawing dramatic new conclusions about why the Inquisition began, how it worked, and why it was allowed to last for over 300 years. The Inquisition employed scribes who, like modern secretaries, kept detailed records of all its work. These documents provide a real understanding not only of the methods it employed, but also of the psychological effects on its suspects. At the heart of the Inquisition's work was the interrogation. A prisoner would be grilled for hours on end. These ancient and sinister methods have lived on, aped in the modern world by oppressive political and religious regimes, from the Gestapo to the KGB. The interrogation would start calmly enough, with seemingly innocent questions about the prisoner's lifestyle and that of his family. The Inquisition would interrogate you at length about how you, what you did and what your family did, because it wasn't only you that they were concerned with, it was everybody that you might know, what they called your accomplices. And they will say to you, what's your name? Do you know why you've been arrested? No. The Inquisition does not arrest people for nothing. Are you aware of that, if you say so? Have you anything to say to us, any confession you make? Because the voluntary confession was the one which would get you off with least trouble. No, I have nothing to say. I don't know why you've arrested me. Go down to the cell and think about it. A prisoner might be locked up in solitary confinement for weeks, even months on end. The jailer is only human contact. But eventually the Inquisitor would call on them to answer more questions and to pressure the prisoner into confession. You might then come up next time and the Inquisitor would say, well, have you anything to tell us? And you might say, well, you know when so-and-so says that I was there? Well, actually, it was like this and I can remember now, it's a long time ago. At this point, the prisoner might hope that a small confession would be enough for the Inquisitor to stop the interrogation. On the contrary, the Inquisition picks away at the scab, or if you like it, it pulls a string, and in the end, the psychological pressure, the loneliness, the anxiety about your family, the anxiety about yourself, means that in the end, you will probably simply be unable to withstand the pressure, and you'll want to confess. 
Inquisition did not hurry its justice. Some trials and interrogations lasted years, during which the prisoners languished in jail. But in the eyes of their captors, the prisoners had committed the most vile crime of the medieval world, heresy. It's unfamiliar to us now, but in those days, heresy, to question the word of God as written in the Bible, was a very serious crime, in many ways worse than murder. A murderer could at least be forgiven, and his soul could ascend to heaven. But an unrepentant heretic was on a one-way journey to hell. Heresy, uh, believing things that the church uh, said were untrue, heresy imperiled your soul. And there's almost a way of seeing it as analogous to that great fear we have today of cancer. Because heresy was seen as an illness which could rot your entire spiritual well-being to the point that you were uh, uh, beyond redemption. And um, what's more, and perhaps in this case uh, heresy is worse than cancer, you could catch it from other people. The Inquisition saw itself as a surgeon acting on the wishes of the all-powerful Catholic Church. It had to cut out the cancer of heresy from the minds of the Spanish people before it spread any further. Symptoms of heresy were many and various, from doubting the resurrection of Christ to sexual indiscretions like adultery and homosexuality. You could also find yourself facing the Inquisition for what today would seem like the most casual and insignificant remark. You could make, for example, a heretical statement. Uh, a man is sitting around the table, he's playing cards, and he starts to swear and curse, and uh, he curses the Virgin Mary and says, it couldn't be a virgin, it's impossible. Not in nature, it's not natural, it should be so. Somebody would report him to the Inquisition, the Inquisition would summons him, uh, and he would be asked, what did he mean by that? Not only did the Inquisition take an interest in remarks that questioned Christian beliefs, they also investigated people whose morality, particularly sexual morality, veered from Christian teaching. This had a bewildering effect in peasant communities. Other things that they were brought before the Inquisition on were, was particularly this notion of simple fornication, which was saying that you believed that it was okay for two single people to have sex. Not, not actually doing it, but saying that you believed that it was okay. Of course, within peasant culture, where premarital and extramarital sex were a regular part of peasant lives, it made absolutely no sense to them that sex between single people was, would not be all right. But in the eyes of the Inquisition, it made perfect sense. A heresy had been committed. If an interrogation didn't produce an adequate explanation, the Inquisitor might call upon the services of the most feared servant of the Spanish Inquisition, the torturer. Actual torture techniques were many and various, from simple flogging to more elaborate and imaginative methods. The strapado was a variant on hanging. The victim was first rendered motionless by having their feet and hands bound. With their arms forced behind their backs, they were hoisted off the ground, causing massive strain on the shoulders. This pain was intensified by dropping the victim. Stopping the fall just short of the ground would give the victim a huge jolt, dislocating the shoulders with an audible snap. The Inquisitor could then step in and continue the questioning, hoping the pain would prompt a different response. But as modern academics now realize, the use of torture, while traumatic, was very much the norm in this unsophisticated age. There was no alternative, at least they didn't see any alternative, I and mean, they didn't have mind-altering drugs or anything like that at that time, truth serums. There was no alternative if you were sure that a person had more to say but was quite deliberately impeding the work of the Inquisition by refusing to confess. Or if you thought, and this was common enough, that a person was saying nothing in order to defend or protect, say, members of their families. So sometimes the Inquisition sought no alternative but to order torture. But what heresy was so serious and damaging 
that it required the establishment of an inquisition. Examination of the records reveals the answer. Quite simply, being Jewish. Medieval Europe was not a pleasant place to be Jewish. Tensions between Jews and Christians had been strained since the days of the New Testament. Christian teaching at the time stated that the Jews were responsible for the crucifixion of Christ, and they refused to accept him as the Son of God. Jews were persecuted at various times in many European countries. It wasn't difficult to stir up anti-Jewish feelings in 14th century Christendom. All that was needed was something or someone to ignite the fuse of hatred. Communities can live together peacefully for generations uh, in, in medieval Spain, I suppose, just as in uh, the Balkans today. It doesn't go beyond local politics until, that is, somebody decides that it's in their interests to make uh, a bigger issue out of these tensions. A well-known anti-Jewish preacher named Ferran Martinez did just that. In 1391, he exploited a temporary lack of church leadership in Seville and used his position to incite actual physical violence against local Jews. In scenes that echo the early persecutions of Jews in Nazi Germany, a Christian mob marched into the city's Jewish quarter. They trapped hundreds in the narrow alleys and began a series of assaults. So intense was the violence and panic that in one particular street, hundreds of Jews lost their lives. The street is now known as Calle de la Muerte, the Street of the Dead. Between June and August of that year, a wave of mob violence and attacks on Jews spread across the whole of Spain, from Seville in the south to Barcelona in the north. The death toll was in the thousands. Next hundred years, Spain was full of brooding anti-Semitism. The power and influence of the Catholic Church continued to grow, demanding an unquestioning conformity to the one true faith, Christianity. Under this pressure, over 150,000 Jews fled Spain, but over a quarter of a million remained. They renounced their religious and cultural heritage and converted to Christianity, at least on the surface. In the small back streets of Cordoba is an abandoned synagogue. This building is extraordinary simply because it still exists. It's one of only three medieval synagogues in all of Spain that still stands. Some were converted into churches, but most were destroyed. The new converts, or conversos as they were known, were now able to take up positions in society that had been the exclusive preserve of Christians. Many conversos were more than happy to exploit this benefit of their new religion. There's a very famous case of the rabbi of Burgos converting uh, to Catholicism and becoming the bishop of Burgos. And this has got to raise some eyebrows if you think, uh, you know, how sincere can anyone be, you know, be the rabbi and then turn around and become the bishop? It just doesn't make sense. Some people might be suspicious of it. the rivalry, the animosity, those feelings of, at times, real hatred by the old Christians to uh, the Jewish communities wasn't just about religion. It was also about competition for jobs and for status, because those areas where uh, Jewish families were allowed to make their living were restricted by the crown. But if they became new Christians, if they became converted uh, members of the uh, mainstream Christian community, what was to stop them moving in and taking the jobs of the old Christians? For a century, resentment and suspicion grew. The Jews who had converted and become successful outside the Jewish community were the most suspect of all in the eyes of the old Christians. The old Christian population believed that these new converts were not true Christians, that their new faith was a sham, that they still practiced Judaism in secret. Not surprisingly, when the Inquisition was created, its first targets were these conversos. The Inquisition was the first formal mechanism to cleanse Spain of false belief. 
The Inquisition was organized and methodical. It appointed teams known as tribunals and sent them all over Spain to uncover and exterminate heresy. The size of the tribunal varied, but had at its core a grand inquisitor, the boss. He was supported by two other inquisitors. They had at their disposal the scribe and the services of a doctor to monitor the health of suspects because the suspects might end up in the hands of the torturer, hired from the civil authorities to extract just that little bit more. But what each tribunal also needed, more than anything else, was suspects. Heresy was surely being committed. It was just a matter of finding the heretics. How did the Inquisition go about it? The first step was to ask for volunteers. Many people willingly came forward. This was a good way for old Christians to show what good Catholics they were, to confess, receive a penance, and be forgiven. The Inquisition welcomed such confessions, issuing small penances and reconciling the person back into the church. This worked well, but only for petty offences, which wasn't quite what the Inquisition was after. They impressed upon the population that it was their Christian duty to actively assist the Inquisition. In other words, to betray their friends, neighbors, and family. Even this wasn't enough, so further evidence was gathered by using informants, Inquisition spies. These spies were known as familiares, and they were rewarded for their spying and betrayal with elevated social standing. They scrutinized the lifestyles of their neighbors, eavesdropping on conversations, reporting anything suspicious back to the Inquisition. With no state intelligence force to call upon, the Inquisition developed methods that were both ingenious and effective. The only way it can collect information is by inviting the public to participate. It has no secret archives, it has no database, it just sits there and asks people to come to it with what they know about the practice of religion by their neighbors. It is a system based on the populace as a whole participating in a great movement of espionage on their own neighbors. This was one of the darkest aspects of the Spanish Inquisition, and it would invariably lead to a knock on the door under the cover of darkness. You would find that at dead at night, the Inquisition would come, the house would be surrounded, you would be arrested with everybody else in the house, with your wife, with your family. You would then be taken in a closed carriage to the Inquisition prison. Once they had their suspect behind bars, the Inquisition employed procedures that were truly sinister. The Inquisition never let the accused know who was giving the evidence against him. And this is one of the first things which opponents of the Inquisition in the early years of its establishment denounced very, very strongly. They said, secret testimony is illegal. And of course, it was illegal. It was not allowed by the laws, normal laws of, of, of Spain. But the Inquisition said, we must have it, because if we do not have it, we cannot proceed adequately. And so here we get the beginning of a chain of injustices which begins the big problem of the Inquisition and its procedures. To give the outward appearance of a justice system, an Inquisition prisoner did have the right to a defense attorney. But mounting any sort of credible defense was almost impossible. The Inquisition not only hid the identity of your accusers, they wouldn't even reveal the nature of the crime you'd been accused of. If you were investigated by the Inquisition, I think a great sense of desperation must have come over you because you didn't know what you were being accused of. So how could you know how to defend yourself? It must have been an absolutely awful position to be in. So the pressures on an individual when the Inquisition came knocking at the door must have been absolutely unbearable. Isolated, scared, and disorientated, the prisoner would be thrown into jail. It's difficult to imagine the conditions in a medieval prison, but enough written information survives 
to paint a vivid picture. As one prisoner wrote upon his eventual release, the cell floor was brick, the walls formed of stone and very thick. The place was very cold in winter and so damp that my clothes were in a state of perpetual moisture. Such was my abode for nearly three years. Although there were rules governing the conditions in which prisoners were to be kept, they were not necessarily adhered to. The local inquisitor was required to inspect the prison on a weekly basis, but this assumed he was doing his duty with care and attention, which wasn't always the case. One report on the conditions in the prison in Cordoba refers to the jail as horrible dens overrun with rats, snakes and other vermin where the wretched captives sickened in despair were starved and the attendants maltreated them like dogs. The Inquisition Tribunal in Cordoba was infamous not only for the conditions in its jail but also for having a particularly sadistic inquisitor, Diego Luquero. He became notorious for arresting hundreds and hundreds of suspect Christians, that is, new Christians or conversos. And in fact, in two occasions in the early 16th century, he actually had over 100 people burnt in one afternoon. And the burnings took place just in front of the castle, in what was ironically known, as it still is, as the Field of the Holy Martyrs. It was all too easy for sadistic inquisitors to indulge their viciousness. They, and they alone, decided when, how, and how often to exploit the torturer's talents. One of the Inquisition's most imaginative tortures was the toca, or water torture. The victim was bound, secured to a rack, and forced to swallow a long length of absorbent cloth. When no more cloth could be forced into the throat, water was poured into the mouth, triggering the swallowing reflex. The victim would ingest more and more of the material until it entered his stomach. The cloth could then be wrenched out with agonizing results. Although these early victims of the Inquisition were largely Jews, or at least suspect new Christians, anyone who was not an ethnic Spaniard and a true Roman Catholic had become unwelcome in Spain by the end of the 15th century. Spain today is a modern, vibrant, cosmopolitan country, secure under its Catholic faith and proud of its royal family there are only a few visible signs of the Inquisition ever having existed. But 500 years ago, Spain, as we know it today, did not exist. The land was divided into a number of separate kingdoms. In the Plaza de España in Seville, ceramic murals chart the major events that have helped forge modern Spain. Across the 54 murals, a number of themes emerge. Royalty, religion, and war. Each one vital to the story of the Spanish Inquisition. Up to the time of the Inquisition, many of the Spanish kingdoms had been ruled by Muslims or Moors. The Moorish influence can still be seen today. The city of Córdoba is dominated by a single building, the Mesquita, or mosque. This massive building, the size of four football fields, was once one of the jewels of the medieval world. It's clear evidence of the Moorish domination of this part of Spain. But the Christian monarchs of Castile and Aragon wanted to unite Spain under a single government and a single religion, Catholicism. As has happened many times since, wars began in the name of religion. 
In the ensuing battles, the Moors were driven further and further south by the Christian armies. The Moors were finally overthrown in 1492, the same year that King Ferdinand of Aragon and Queen Isabella of Castile sent Christopher Columbus on the voyage that eventually led to the discovery of the New World and the Americas. The Spanish still celebrate the victory of the Christians over the Muslims. In Alcoy, in the southeast of the country, the centerpiece of the annual fiesta is a reenactment of the Moors being ousted by Christians. It's a colorful and exciting scene to the modern tourist. But it speaks of a time not that long ago when religious intolerance invariably led to violence and bloodshed. Isabella and Ferdinand probably thought their troubles were over. They soon discovered that despite a hundred years of conversions, the Jews and their new Christian descendants were still a major problem. As the Christian frontier was rolled back and the Christian kingdoms moved further south and incorporated the, the various Jewish communities in the great cities like Cordoba, Seville and eventually Granada, um, they had to ask themselves what were they going to do with these Jewish communities? Were they going to tolerate them? Now, Islam can tolerate both Jews and Christians because they count as children of the book. They have a special position within the Muslim religion. But Christianity doesn't have that, that room for manoeuvre. And it was thought to be a Christian duty to convert all uh, people of a different religion to faith in uh, Christ, the Son of God. Ferdinand and Isabella were good Catholics, but they also craved political power. They had underestimated the volatile hatred between Christians and Jews, which threatened peace and unity. But they'd face a terrible loss if everyone who was then a Jew, or who had Jewish ancestry, were expelled or locked up. Many of these people were Spain's most outstanding and upstanding citizens. Isabella and Ferdinand couldn't afford to lose them from society. But nor could they allow the instability and hatred to continue. Clear and decisive action was needed. In March of 1492, they gave the remaining Jews an ultimatum. Convert to Christianity, or leave Spain for good. The Jews of Spain had six months to comply. I think the dilemma which the Jewish families faced in the 15th century to convert, and especially when Isabel ordered them in 1492 to convert or leave the country, was a particularly difficult decision for them to make. Would they betray their religion or would they turn their back on a country uh, where they'd lived for hundreds of years? And I think for them, uh, having to make this decision must have been an absolutely cruel one. Not only was it cruel, it didn't work as the king and queen had hoped. Resentment grew even stronger between old Christians and the new converts from Judaism. Old Christians simply didn't trust the motives of the conversos or new Christians any more than they had for the last hundred years. Conversos were not feared, they were hated. They were hated because, first, uh, the general population uh, refused to believe in their sincere conversion to Christianity, to Catholicism. And so this is seen as, as treacherous. Because they are not sincere, that means that they're Jewish. The old Christians were convinced that many of these new conversos were secretly maintaining their Jewish faith that they kept not only Christian holy days, but also Jewish Sabbaths and festivals, days that required special and obvious preparation. It rind is here on Fridays, because it is a special ceremony for the Jews, and because it is a sin for them to trim hair, beards, or nails on a Sabbath. All the women would bathe themselves according to Jewish ceremony. They shut themselves in an interior patio so that the servants would not see them. The suspicions of the old Christians were aroused even further if they suspected a converso was still keeping the kosher laws on hygiene and food. In order to give the appearance that they were eating pork, they pretended to eat it and secretly threw it underneath the table. It wasn't enough simply to say that you believed in Christianity. You also had to show that you were living the same sort of lifestyle as your old Christian neighbors. For example, did you eat pork? If you refused to eat pork and you were supposed to be a Christian, 
well, the authorities might think, well, perhaps these people haven't truly converted. Today, there's still evidence of the old fear of being accused of being Jewish. Cafes and bars still hang pork in public view. This harks back to the time of the Inquisition, when it was a visible announcement that the owner ate pork and was therefore a true Christian. It wasn't just the Jewish laws on food that could draw the attention of the Inquisition. Something as simple as hanging laundry out to dry on the wrong day of the week could be an indication of heresy. In the 16th century, for example, there was a case of uh, one woman who was investigated by the Inquisition simply because she changed her linen on a Saturday. And this was felt to be a sign that perhaps she was reverencing the Jewish Sabbath rather more than a Christian Sunday. The old Christian resentment against the secret Jews reached a boiling point, especially in cities like Seville. Under enormous political pressure, Ferdinand and Isabella went to Seville in a last-ditch effort to find a solution before their dreams of a secure rule under religious orthodoxy were dashed. And so it was that, after getting advice from the highest authorities of the Catholic Church in Seville, Isabella and Ferdinand did finally make the fateful decision that Spain needed an Inquisition. But despite their royal status, they couldn't create such a body without special permission from the ultimate Catholic, the Pope. On November the 1st, Pope Sixtus IV gave his permission, and the Spanish Inquisition was born. It began quietly, but as the number of tribunals grew, Ferdinand and Isabella realized they needed someone to take an overall responsibility. They applied to the Pope and he issued a papal bull appointing Thomas de Torquemada as the first Grand Inquisitor. Torquemada presided over the early years of the Inquisition, some of the bloodiest of its entire existence, when the vast majority of its victims were Jewish. He also established many of the procedures the Inquisition was to follow for hundreds of years. Thomas de Torquemada was the confessor of the Queen and uh, was also anti-Semitic. On the other hand, he drew up the first instructions of the Inquisition. He set down in black and white print what it could do and what it could not do. And thanks also to him, the Inquisition became a controllable, bureaucratic body, which followed his rules, really, for the next 100 years. The rules of the Inquisition didn't differentiate between men and women. Indeed, they recognized that the Jewish bloodline was passed through the female line, and that Jewish women were very influential in the converso community. So the Inquisition had no qualms in applying torture to women with the same vigor as to men. Female victims were stripped before being tortured. For some women, the humiliation of being naked in the presence of men was torture enough. But if that failed, the torturer would begin his work. Potro was a binding torture. The victim was secured to a rack or a vertical pole, and ropes were positioned around the body, allowing pain to be administered to specific areas with a fine degree of control. It also allowed the Inquisitor to conduct a continuous interrogation stopping only to have the torturer adjust the victim's level of pain. Care was needed. Inquisition rules instructed that torture was not to be used to punish or kill the victim. You can read the scenes because the notary the, the clerk takes every word down, every scream, every utterance is actually taken down. And um, you can see the way his hand shakes as well uh, when doing it. But records show that torture was a shockingly effective means of extracting confessions. She was tied on the potro with the cords, and the garrots were ordered to be tightened. She said, I don't remember. 
Take me away. Señores, release me, for I do not remember. Señores, for God's sake, have mercy on me. Do you not see how these people are killing me? I did it. For God's sake, let me go. Once the Inquisition had gained that all-important confession, it was time to pass sentence. This was done at the grand finale to the Inquisition's work in any given town, the Otto da Fe, or Act of Faith. Otto da Fe were a strange but impressive mix of church service, supreme court, and circus. The guilty were paraded in front of the hushed crowd and punishments were handed out. Auto de Fe were deliberately stage managed to be a grand theatrical display of the power of the Inquisition and many reached Super Bowl scale. Like the civil authorities, the Inquisition had a variety of punishments at its disposal, from imprisonment to banishment to death. But it also had some uniquely peculiar punishments. In the San Benito penance, the guilty party was forced to wear a loose vest emblazoned with a diagonal red cross. This branded the wearer a heretic. Convicted heretics had to wear the San Benito at all times, a humiliation to the wearer, unable to escape the constant public gaze. But that was the point. It was a punishment that was also a deterrent, a reminder to others of the price paid for falling foul of the Inquisition. But the ultimate penalty was death by fire. Burning at the stake was reserved for two kinds of victims. Determined, obstinate heretics who simply refused to cooperate and repeat offenders. In the days of the Inquisition, two strikes and you were most definitely out. To avoid staining their hands, the Inquisition didn't carry out the sentence of death. Instead, they handed the accused over to the civil authorities who inflicted the sentence. Even at the end, there was still a glimmer of hope for the convicted heretics. If they confessed their sins, they could escape being burnt alive. But the reprieve was being strangled to death instead. A grisly option, but one that many took. Refusing to confess meant the fire would be lit and an agonizing death was imminent. The records do not disguise the gory details of death at the stake. When the flames attacked him, he bent, twisted and writhed till he could no more. He was as fat as a suckling pig and burnt internally, so that, after the flames left him, he continued burning like a hot coal, and, bursting open, his entrails fell out like those of Judas. People could be tried and punished by the Inquisition, even if they were already dead. Hundreds of people were convicted and burnt at the stake in effigy long after they had died. The justice and effectiveness of the Inquisition had to be seen to be done. Five hundred years later, it's hard to accurately gauge how many people died at the hands of the Inquisition. The records are incomplete. But modern academics are now realizing that there has been a great deal of exaggeration, especially regarding the use of the torturer. The Inquisition authorities really didn't like this very much because it meant bringing somebody in from outside. And it, it would be somebody who was considered coarse and uneducated. And the Inquisition did not want this sort of person interfering or having anything to do with the process of investigating heresy and uh, conduct you know, the, the people's souls and all the rest of it. We have 
very firm figures for torture. At certain periods, it's used uh, extensively in the 17th century, but for very, very short periods, and even then by extensively, I mean possibly as much as five or six percent of prisoners might be tortured. But in total, the number of cases is very, very, very small indeed. Torture was reserved for only the most serious cases of heresy, but there's no doubt that torture was practiced. But I suspect then, as now, people have exaggerated the use of torture. And in a sense, that's the Inquisition's fault. Its proceedings weren't public. It had its own prisons, but nobody quite knew what went on in them. And so, when you don't know what's happening, you always imagine the worst. Does this mean that our inherited view of the Inquisition is wrong? Chances are the answer is yes. The reason? Propaganda. Anti-Spanish, anti-Catholic propaganda, known by academics as the Black Myth or the Black Legend. The Black Legend was propaganda created deliberately by the English government and by the Dutch authorities in the 16th century. And as a result, clearly, they exaggerated everything uh, and in that way convinced the rest of the world that Spain was a bad country. The Black Legend originated as Spain was establishing itself as a formidable power in the Americas. Spain's rivals in the New World, the English and the Dutch, were both Protestant countries who used the activities of the Spanish Catholic Inquisition, particularly its use of torture, as a way to blacken the name of their enemy. It was good political and religious spin. The Black Legend was a response, I think, to Spain's growing power in the 16th centuries. Partly it referred to Spain's oppressive empire in Europe, in Italy, and later in the Netherlands. And it also referred to the ways in which the Spaniards uh, conquered the New World and tried to enforce their way of life and, of course, their brand of Christianity. So I think the black legend is the idea that Spain will use cruelty to extend Catholicism. This view was most definitely not shared by native Spaniards. They had come to rely on the Inquisition. It provided them with a clear Catholic national identity. The Spanish Inquisition had public support, which is why it lasted for over 300 years. During that time, the Inquisition's attention shifted. For the first 50 years, it focused on the conversos. But after that, it succeeded in finding heretics in other communities. And at times, the Inquisition looks like a, like a monster that has to find new ways of feeding itself. At first, it confines its interest mainly to Jews. Then it starts looking at uh, the practices of Moors. In the 1520s and onwards, it looks at the activities of potential Lutherans or Protestants in Spain. And then, in the second half of the century, it reinvents itself once more and starts, if you like, looking into the bedroom, finding out what ordinary Christians are doing with each other, what they're saying to each other, and just how they're behaving. For most ordinary Spaniards, the Inquisition was vitally important. They believed that because it had been originally instigated by the Pope, it was God's work. To reject the Inquisition was to reject the will of God. Who would do that in what was now a thoroughly Catholic country? First of all, we can't ignore that for many ordinary Spaniards, the Inquisition, the Holy Office, was going about a good Christian task. It was protecting them from the possibility of infection from heresy. It was setting standards for behavior in the community. It was trying to prevent antisocial behavior, as we might say today. But I think there's another reason, and that is, who would have the political courage to abolish the Inquisition? Initially, that political courage came from outside Spain. French armies, commanded by Napoleon Bonaparte, invaded and conquered Spain in 1808. One of Napoleon's first acts was to disband the Inquisition. He objected to a religious body having precedence over civil authorities. But the French presence was short-lived. The Spanish soon recaptured their territories and immediately reinstated the Inquisition. 
But just as surely as the fires of the auto da fe subsided, so too did the Inquisition. Even though it was re-established in 1815, the world had changed. It was a very different place to how it had been in the late 15th century. The Inquisition didn't have the momentum to survive for long. The rest of Europe, and with it Spain, ceased to believe in heresy. A high proportion of the population do not treat heresy seriously. The Inquisition is no longer punishing people, so it runs out of time, and they eventually abolish it because of political reasons they see it as not being consonant with the progressive image which they now wish to project to Europe. On July the 15th, 1834, Spain's monarch finally dissolved the Spanish Inquisition. The name of that monarch was Isabella II. It was almost as if the Inquisition had come full circle, and although we may have received the distorted history of the Inquisition's torturous ways, it still has a very potent legacy. Inquisitions have not stopped, and religion, race and politics continue to fuel conflict across the globe. Catholic and Protestant tensions in the north of Ireland, ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, or the Taliban using religion as a means of imposing political power in Afghanistan. All of these inquire into the souls of their neighbors to see if they share the same beliefs and challenge the notion that differences will be tolerated. But we don't have to travel that far to realize how easily an inquisition can be born. What was George Orwell writing about when he wrote his book 1984, about Big Brother, who wanted to control not only what you said or did, but what you thought? You can see it after all in the United States in the early 1950s in terms of the Hollywood Inquisition or the Un-American Activities Committee. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm framing my answer in the only way in which any American citizen... I think the Spanish Inquisition is, in a sense, still with us. I think whenever people feel that civil liberties, even in modern democracies, are threatened, they know how bad, or at least they think they know, how bad things can become because they have the image of the Spanish Inquisition at the back of their minds. Perhaps that's what Pope John Paul II had in mind when, in April 2000, on a visit to the Holy Land, he apologized for 2,000 years of Catholic violence, persecution and blunders. He asked for forgiveness for the use of violence that some have committed in the service of truth against the Jews and of human rights violations and hostility assumed towards followers of other religions.